Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the crypto economics track for NonCon 2020. Um, <clears throat> we're here live with our first speaker of the day, Vinay Gupta. Um, for the past weeks, we've had to sort of reimagine what this conference could look like, and we're very happy to now have found mm. this solution for it. Uh, it's for everybody here, it's probably a, a time of reimagining what uh, social interaction looks like, but uh, we're this is the crypto hopefully track finding a good way to organize conferences digitally over this way. Uh, this track was organized as a collaboration between Parallel Polis, the organizers of NonCon, as well as Token Engineering, uh, Global Gathering, and us, the Research Institute for Crypto Economics in Vienna. Um, <clears throat> we're having a bit of a packed schedule over the next two days. And I'm very happy to have uh, Vinay here today. Um, <clears throat> with his talk, he's probably going to attract a lot of viewers. Uh, I've heard of a lot of people who are very excited about you coming here. Um, and uh, I think I don't need to give a big introduction to you. You're the CEO and founder of Matterium. Um, you've been prominent in the space for a long time. And uh, I think with this, I'm going to pass it over to you. Great. Um, remind me how long I am talking for. Let me start with that. <laughs> so we have um, available about 50 minutes of a talk for you if you want. If you want to go shorter, that's fine. But right. we would have said 50 minutes of talk, then 10 minutes of Q&A, and then we still have a transitional period. Um, if you want to go shorter, that's fine. We yeah, can... I think more time for Q&A, I think, is probably a good idea because uh, people are going to get very bored watching a live stream. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. So, um, welcome to the end of the world, everybody. <laughs> you know, we're we're here in uh, global conditions which haven't really been seen uh, ever. You know, we've had pandemics before, we've had plagues before, um, but we've never had the com the combination of an extremely fragile, high tech society and a lot of advanced science and technology, which puts us in a position where we have this thing happening. Uh, and we also know far more about it than any of our ancestors would have in the same the same position. So on one hand, that makes everything better because at least we understand what it is people are dying of. And on the other hand, it makes things worse because our society is so interwoven that things just potentially tear to pieces. Uh, and we can already see this in terms of the strain on things like the medical supply chain. Lots and lots of problems. So what I want to talk about is um, the underperforming nature of crypto, right? Uh, and I don't mean performing in the simple sense of like, you know, number goes up and to the right. I mean, performing in the sense of where's the global change, right? We've had, you know, 10 years of Bitcoin, uh, an unbelievable amount of money has been made and lost on these technologies. Um, we've had infinitely well-funded development teams crunching various problems for years and years and years, particularly things that came out of the ICO markets in Ethereum. Um, where's the revolution? Like, why have we not succeeded in producing a single widely used application which is directly transforming people's lives in any kind of significant, meaningful way? Right? A lot of people's lives have been transformed by the money, um, but you know, to all intents and purposes, uh, every dollar made in these technologies was a dollar lost because trading is a zero-sum game. Right? Every penny that's made in trading came out of somebody else's pockets. So there's been an enormous wealth transfer but I'd like to argue that there's actually been very little absolute wealth creation. And that I think is very important for us to observe because wealth creation is how you get a permanent seat in the global economy. Wealth transfer only lasts so long until people no longer believe that wealth creation is happening, um, you know, wealth transfer is possible. But once people lose faith in the idea that these things are fundamentally wealth creating, numbers will stop moving and they'll stop moving permanently. So. What I want to basically suggest is that we need a fundamentally different understanding of power if we're ever going to get a seat at the table. Now, what do I mean by power? Right? Um, power is not an easy thing to define. Um, the old definition of the state, and I'll define the state first, then power, uh, comes from a guy called Max Weber. And Weber's definition of the state is that the state is a single entity with a monopoly on legitimate violence inside of a different geography. Uh, and Weber's definition is well and good as far as it goes, in that most healthy functioning nation states fit that description pretty much precisely. What Weber's definition doesn't give us is any tooling to handle situations 
uh, where you have a problem, right? And for example, civil war or uh, a place like Gaza, it doesn't appear that you have an absence of state, right? You, you don't have a void, right? What you have is multiple entities, all of which act like the state, and to a reasonable degree, all of which are the state. And they're sharing a geography. And the fact that you have multiple state-like entities sharing a geography doesn't stop the application of violence by any of them. They seem to overlap. And Weber's model doesn't really allow for this idea of overlapping sovereignties. So I have a slightly different definition of the state, which I think a lot of libertarians will like, which is the state is any entity that has the ability to um, pardon crimes either before or after the crime is committed. Um, so after the crime is committed is pretty simple. This is the cover up. Somebody is killed. Somebody comes in and gets rid of the evidence. It is as if nothing a criminal had ever happened. The problem just vanishes. And this obviously is ubiquitous, right? We all know that this kind of stuff happens all the time. But, uh, that's, you know, case one. Case two uh, is the situation where this stuff is done before the time, right? And in that situation, you have a, a fundamentally different situation, right? Um, that situation is one in which if you pardon assault, you get police. If you pardon theft, you get tax collectors. And if you pardon murder, you get armies. And that is a, an approach, right? It doesn't necessarily describe everything that states do. It doesn't describe everything that states are. But it certainly gives us a comprehensive way of imagining what the state is in a way that explains a lot of what happens in these kind of weird edge areas. So you take an area like Chicago in the golden age of Al Capone, and you can make a pretty compelling argument that the mafia have become state-like. They do all kinds of criminal stuff. Nobody ever touches them. If you get too close to touching them, you discover, you know, whatever it is, a sawn-off horse head in your bed. And that kind of persuades you that maybe you don't want to do this anymore. Um, now, why does this matter for crypto, right? Crypto has always had the dream of creating an environment in which crime is impossible. Right? That's crime by the state in terms of things like uh, seized assets. It's crime by other individuals because the crypto stops them fishing in your bank account. Right? And that is a very radical model because what we're suggesting here is that by stopping crime, we also stop the functioning of the nation state. See how this works? We make a system that's perfectly secure. The individuals are sovereign. But if we focus a lot on uh, sovereignty of the individual, we get into all kinds of weird questions about interdependency. If we're all connected to the same electricity grid and the electricity grid is run by the nation state, in what sense is it that we have transcended the nation state and become sovereign individuals? Not so much, right? Never mind the fiber optic cables. But if you think of this in terms of creating zones in which crime is impossible in all of its forms, then you begin to talk about the state being excluded by the virtue of crime being excluded. And just because the state makes it legal doesn't mean it's not crime. That's an important distinction. Um, so, is that our experience of crypto? Is crypto a place where there is zero crime? And the answer is no. Crypto is a place which is a washing crime, right? All manner of fraud, all manner of theft, something like what, 10 or 15, 30% of the Bitcoin that ever came into existence uh, has been uh, lost or stolen, right? We have enormous problems with scams where incredible promises were made and then people just walked off with hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we've got all manner of malfeasance at the top tier where we've got a bunch of big projects that did multi-billion dollar ICOs and have completely failed to return usable systems. And the general quality of software engineering is absolutely horrific, right? A lot of money has been taken and very little has been returned in result. So my suggestion with all of this is that we need a fundamental rethink in terms of how crypto fits into the global system because we failed to deliver on most of the promises that were originally made and we have to modify our approach or we're going to have some real problems. Sorry, I'm just trying to get a second device up so I can see whether there are any questions as we go. Um, so let us have a little think about what is the step forward for us, right? What would it mean to operate a zone with zero crime, right? Well, for one thing, you'd have to make people accountable for what they do, right? We would have to know exactly who it was that had done some of these ICO type scams, and we'd have to stop those people stealing anybody else's money again after that. We'd have to just find a way of getting involved in those systems, which just prevented people taking the money 
or if they'd taken the money, we'd have to make sure that they spent it honestly, and if not, we'd have to hold them to account. What does that mean? Right? Contracts that force them to give the money back, maybe. Right? Transfer of assets, they go and buy a big house off the back of an ICO. How do we get that house back, sell it, and give that money back to their token holders? Right? Because if you have an environment which is simply, we are sovereign, we can do whatever the hell we like, and then what happens with that sovereignty is that the entire thing turns into a wasteland of Mad Max level fraud, where you can't trust anybody to tell you the truth about anything, and all of these amazingly powerful technologies for keeping systems honest are put into the hands of awful scammers that then successfully get away with the proceeds of their crimes. How are we ever going to run something that looks like a fair society? Right? How can any of the promises that crypto have made work? You know, you, the libertarians say, right, no force, no fraud. Well, okay, we managed to squeeze the force out of the crypto economy pretty successfully. There are only a handful of cases where somebody gets strapped to a chair and whacked with a wrench until they hand over their keys. But the fraud problem has been absolutely gigantic. And we've done very, very little work on driving that out of existence. Now, why is that the case? Why have we not done a better job of getting on hold of the fraud? A lot of it is because people have taken a kind of, well, you know, caveat emptor kind of approach, right? Emptor. Uh, if you bought it, you should be smart enough to take a look at the situation and make your own decisions. Responsibility is on the buyer, right? Um, and that is true to a degree, but the consequence of that approach has been a total wasteland. So do we have to rethink that? Right? Um, if we had to rethink that, what would it look like? Well, you could say that this is a digital identity problem, right? We need some ability to bind identities to actions so that when people commit fraud, we can identify who they are. And then we can, in some way, protect the people that they've defrauded from the consequences of their decisions. Maybe, right? Um, maybe it's a question of judicial process built into things like smart contracts so that you could go and get hold of fundamental information about um what has been done with the money and if it doesn't fit the original prospectus you can automatically claw those funds back but all of these approaches are relatively limited right they're relatively limited because they're implementations of a principle without ever making the principle explicit right? so what is the fundamental principle if we are serious about uh, no force and no fraud what does it mean to run a system with no fraud ideally and this is where we begin to get into the interesting territory. Ideally, what that would mean is that you could see exactly what the long-term disposition of funds would be before the funds were committed. Now, there's a lot of talk right now about things like distributed autonomous organizations, and I think for the most part that work is nonsense, and I'll come back and explain why in a moment. But the idea that you could do something like take a project management plan and a staffing roster bake that stuff into a smart contract and then show people when you put your money into this project this is the spending vector that the money will be pushed down and these are the gates where input will be taken in from oracles to decide how the money is spent now this begins to sound a little more interesting because at that point if you're going to commit fraud it becomes quite slippery right it becomes very very difficult to arrange and structure uh, uh, fraud because we can actually see exactly where the money is and we can see what it's going to be bound to in future and how it will be committed. This is not so different from a structure that exists in the real world called a prospectus where investors are shown a detailed business plan before funds are handed over and then once the funds are handed over the directors of the company are responsible for managing the funds in accordance with the terms of the prospectus market radically changes and something different happens, they're then responsible for reconfiguring the company and letting everybody know exactly what they did and why. And this is a, a very, very powerful construct. Um, it's an enormous pain in the ass. These things are fabulously expensive to produce, often millions of dollars. It's the documentation that you're forced to do by things like the SEC before you go to the public and take their money by doing something like an ICO. Uh, sorry, an IPO. <laughs> you're you're sort of in one direction, now I'm in the other direction. I'm just going to interrupt you real quick. Yeah. Just if, you, are you aware that the screen sharing is off? Because I hear you clicking through slides. No, no, no. Uh, that's probably just my arm bouncing on my keyboard. There we go. Okay, okay. Yeah, just, just want to make you aware. No slides yet. 
Uh, is there are there questions coming up on the YouTube chat? Because I can't get to the YouTube chat, or is it all coming through uh, the chat here? This will all come through here, and I will collect as well if you would like. Yeah, that'd and be, then, uh, be, it's, it's nice to have comments as, as we go. Because if I say something which people uh, are curious about or that needs more explanation, nice to know that in real time. People can also raise their hand in this chat, and then I can unmute them as well. Okay, great. That was nice. I'm just going to take a second to adjust that camera. Okay. So, this notion of a kind of prospectus, right? What I'm suggesting is that we could do much, much more radical work on um, blocking fraud in crypto as a fundamental principle. Because if it's about no force and no fraud, crypto as it currently stands has done a, done a great job with no force. It's done a horrible job with no fraud. What does it look like to have no fraud? You use smart contracts to describe exactly how the funds which are raised by a project will be spent in the long run. And then the funds are locked onto that agenda. Now, that's interesting because now we've got a sort of per, uh, actionable transparency. Right, um, it, it becomes very close to what they call in some branches of academia a performative speech act. You say what it is that you are going to do, and in the saying of it, it is performed. For example, the phrase "I do" in a wedding ceremony um, actually is the doing of it. That's the part where it happens. Until that happens, it's there. Said it's done. So let's go back and rerun in our heads what the whole ICO extravaganza would have looked like if every company had basically published a timeline with a spending plan implemented as a smart contract that released funds on that vector, and then we had insisted on spending receipts for all of that money being put on chain. In theory, right, you could have gotten into a situation where every single one of these scams would either have failed to launch or very, very, very quickly been identified because where the funds were being spent wouldn't have corresponded to the spending plan locked into a smart contract. They would say in the smart contract that these funds will be used to rent an office, and then you look and the receipt says that these funds were you know, used to spend uh, uh, a villa in the south of France. Like, wait a minute, that is not the office that you said you were going to open in Paris. What is that? So to me, this is the kind of thinking which is required for crypto to get a seat at the global table. Right? If we're going to be in a position where we've actually got a really realistic grip uh, on the environment that we've created, right? if we have a domain, I don't mean in the sense of a domain name, but in the sense of a, a zone that we control, and that zone really is no force and no fraud, because every penny that goes in is carefully accounted for, and you can see exactly what was done with the money. At that point, I think that we would discover that we were a very different kind of people. Right? A lot of the idiotic, foul scam artists that flooded into crypto after the ICO was invented would never have gotten in and would shortly after leave. There'd be far more emphasis on actually writing working software as a natural consequence of raising money. And in the long run, what you wouldn't see is a situation where it's now very, very hard to raise capital in crypto because everybody expects that everything is a ripoff. Uh, and instead, you'd be in a position where it's you know, well known that crypto is a place where you put your money on the table and the wheel spins, and it's very much up to the markets to decide whether the product that people have built is what they wanted or not. But the only way to find out was to build it and sell it. So this is the first principle that I really want to lock in, right? If we are very serious about no force and no fraud, we've got to get serious about the no fraud part of that. We have half or a third of the technical capability to build those kind of systems. And I think that the building of those kind of systems, if it was done in a responsible fashion, would give us a much higher level of investor protection than you get if you do something like give your money to a dot com. Right? Um, it's, a, it's a very direct approach because if we don't regulate ourselves, we will be regulated. Right? The SEC allegedly has something like 1,200 prosecutions of ICOs queued up uh, in an enormous stack. Uh, prior to COVID, they were hiring lawyers right, left, and center, uh, and it looked like they were planning on going on a massive litigation crusade against, the, uh, frankly, the Ethereum space. Um, and I don't know whether that will ever happen. I don't know whether the current administration is pushing that. I don't think anybody's going to start those litigations during the uh, pandemic period. But let's just be aware that if the SEC actually enforces the law, an enormous number of people are going to have to give back all of the money that they raised 
in these fucking ICOs. It's all going to have to go back to original investors. They call it disgorgement. So it would be enormously harder for people to make the case that that kind of behavior was legitimate if we hadn't seen the vast majority of that money simply uh, wasted, right? If there was a ton of working code, if you could point at hundreds of engineers, if you could point at a bunch of innovation which had actually happened, if you could point at projects which had come to market and actually made a decent attempt at selling themselves, it'd be great, right? But instead, what happened is that we lost control of the funds. The investors had no rights, they had no protection. A lot of incredibly horrific legal paperwork was handed out alongside of that money uh, in the form of things like simple agreements for future tokens. And I, I really want to, you know, just, you know, let the gravity of this sink in, right? The reason that crypto is basically walled off in a little corner of reality and we can't breach the fence into the real world is everybody assumes that if we breach the fence into the real world, what's going to happen is they're going to lose all of their money, right? And I really want this to hit home. Like, you know, if you actually look at the performance of money going into crypto portfolios, um, and I'm not talking about in terms of the big projects like Ethereum and Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? Um, but all of the smaller projects, the things which were like the operational arms, the things which were like, okay, we are going to take these technologies and we're going to build the following five or six things on them. The overall performance of the money that went into building the ecosystem rather than just the platforms has been absolutely horrendous, right? Token goes to go up, fueled by hysteria and market fixing. Tokens go down, fueled by reality finally kicks in and there's no product. So... The final thing I want to say on this before we move on to the next part is this. If we were going to actually become functioning parts of the global economy, we had to not allow the space that we were in to be overrun by fraud, right? Because at that point, you can't make any claim that we created a libertarian environment. What we created, unfortunately, to a very substantial degree, was a criminal environment because we had technologies which could have blocked crime and we didn't use them that way. And as a result, an enormous number of people literally got ripped off from one end to the other. And because all the numbers were going up, you know, a lot of that fraud was just buried in growth in the underlying platform tokens. You know, you lose a bunch of money on an ICO, but you make it back up because your remaining ether is worth 40 times what it was the day before. Those are completely exceptional market conditions, right? And those market conditions, let us not forget, every penny that went in came from somebody else taking a loss, right? These numbers don't just appear from nowhere. A lot of people lost a lot of money in crypto, and that money is what fueled the ICO scams. So we have to think about this in terms of wealth transfer versus wealth creation. Crypto was an enormously effective bubble in terms of wealth transfer. It was a terrible machinery in terms of wealth creation. And I uh, bailed very, very, very early. I haven't held tokens in anything, not even Bitcoin or Ether, in years. Um, because I was so unhappy with the amount of market fixing and uh, price rigging that was going on. that I just didn't really want to be making money from those things. Right? When we hit the Dow crisis way back in the day, I looked at the legal underpinnings of what we were standing on and said, there's no way this is going to work. And I divested at that point and remained token clear since then. Now, in this field, that sounds like insanity, right? But if you've got both feet planted in the real world, you have to ask yourself, what is it that is being accomplished that is producing this river of money? And I wasn't willing to profit from the frauds that other people were committing, so I wasn't going to hold their tokens, right? See what I'm saying? Can't make this point any clearer, right? We did not run an honest show as a society and as a culture, and there are inevitably consequences for that. So first thing, if we want a seat at the global table, if we want crypto to slot into the world as a fundamental part of the future, it cannot be in a position where crypto equals fraud. That has to stop now. It has to stop permanently, and we have to basically exile the people that did those kind of scams, kick them out of the community, and never let them back in again. If somebody did an ICO and they haven't spent the money in a wise and responsible way, if they haven't at least attempted as hard as they're able to return value to their investors, why the hell are these people still regarded as being valid parts of the crypto ecosystem? Is the rule not no force, no fraud? And is that not what fraud looks like? We have to be consistent to our values. And I'm by no means a textbook libertarian, but no force, no fraud is a starting point for a conversation. And anybody that can't even agree to those principles does not deserve a seat at the table. So step one, we have to clean up our goddamn act. 
thing one. So thing two, age of unprecedented global crisis, right? You know, <laughs> wave your hands in the air if you think there's a decent chance that the dollar does not survive this year as the world's reserve currency, right? Uh, I would be completely unsurprised if the economic and cultural fallout from the pandemic doesn't break the US into multiple country-like entities that are not really under close federal uh, authority. Uh, and I would be completely unsurprised if it breaks the EU, right? South of Europe has gotten hit so hard by the virus on top of, you know, really 10 years of massive, massive poverty and decline in standards of living. <clears throat> I'd be completely unsurprised if you didn't see a fundamental break in the way the Eurozone operates. Uh, and I think that we are also in very serious danger of having American states simply cede from the Union. I would like um, to add, never mind. Yeah, yeah. But I would totally focus on something else because that's my uh, philosophy with it. Uh, Michael, you are getting kicked. <laughs> I'm sorry, Vinay. Yeah. No, sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't quite hear what was happening. Should I continue, or do you need a second? Uh, no, please continue. I think Michael accidentally unmuted himself. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, hey, so the union, right? Um, very strong possibility that you're going to see a breakdown um, in America, which will probably not be declared as you know Texas is ceding from the union, but will probably simply be they stop doing what the federal government tells them. You see a uh, you know, different transfers of funds. You could see local government beginning to produce its own uh, currency as a way of dealing with their economic problems if the Fed won't give them money. Uh, use of local currencies, as we all know, was very, very common in, for example, Germany uh, between World War One and World War Two, And it was one of the things that pulled the Germans back out of the uh, Depression. Also, um, oh God, I really need to phrase that more carefully but yeah certainly there was a lot of local economic development stimulated by local currencies in the late 1920s early 1930s before other forces kicked in <clears throat> um similarly the swiss have had local currency type systems running as basically trade currencies very successfully all of those kinds of approaches are likely to come back up because america's uh, unemployment rate has just gone through the roof i mean the chart is unprecedented you know, unemployment kind of doodles along at sort of, you know, three, four percent. I think I saw numbers suggesting that it was 15, 20 percent unemployment in the States. Um, <clears throat> all kinds of fundamental problems um, are, you know, maturing, right? We've been in a position where we've known the system was rotten. We've known the system was rotten. We've known the system was rotten. And now it looks like the system is going to completely break in ways which are, impossible to imagine right now you can just about look at the economic data and you know what you see is a total wasteland of people's lives and their dreams because the economy has gotten more and more fragile more and more fragile more and more fragile 40 million americans were on food stamps so direct government subsidies so they can eat in the states before the crisis kicked in at a point where you'd seen an unprecedented wealth transfer to the richest in society because as the economy goes down, the people with capital have the ability to buy things on the way down for far less than they're actually worth, and they're not being shy about doing that. So what this comes to is an opportunity for a total global reorganization of the economic order, and I think a lot of people are going to get on top of that. Um, I think it's very, very, very plausible that you will see large-scale deployment of central bank digital currency. I'd be a little surprised, but not that surprised, if you didn't see uh, an organization like the International Monetary Fund spin up their own event uh, equivalent of something like Facebook's Libra. In fact, I think half of the reason that people came down so hard on Libra is that it was probably pretty close to something which has been planned by central governments themselves as a backup strategy in case the global economy ceases. Uh, let's note that the price of oil has become negative in some places because the oil is still coming out holes in the ground and then there's no place to store it, so you're paying people to take it off your hands. That's actually a thing that's happening right now because nobody's going anywhere, so nobody's burning oil. Right? This is all completely unprecedented. Right? If only there was some kind of technology for running a functional global market to hold all the pieces of this mess together as we go through the crisis and to keep global trade going through this incredibly dark and complicated period. 
some kind of technology that doesn't require you to try and do a bank transfer through a bank where 30% of the people that work for the bank are currently not able to do their jobs, either because they're sick or because they're at home, but they don't have the necessary crypto equipment to be able to log into the bank servers and do transactions, because that stuff can only really be done at head office. Right? Can you imagine, you know, a month and a half from now, trying to figure out what happened to a wire transfer that went missing somewhere, you know, through like Bank of America? What are the odds you're ever going to be able to find that money? with their customer service systems completely hacked to pieces and a whole bunch of their technical stuff stick because they've thinned out the resilience of these systems layer by layer by layer by layer for years, right? Remember a little while ago when Facebook suddenly went crazy and started flagging everybody's posts as spam? Yeah, you know, there was this you know sort of three day period where everything got locked down on Facebook. They basically handed the job over to an algorithm because everybody had been sent home. The algorithm turned out to suck. Same thing in the banking sector. So. What I'm trying to frame here is that we have an unprecedented opportunity to clean up our act, get our shit together, and potentially start providing some useful public services. Now, what kind of useful public services are we talking about? Answer is, I'm not sure yet, right? We've really never examined what the intersection is between crypto technology and a society under unprecedented strain, right? A globe under unprecedented strain. Global society is running into huge problems. We have this amazing cryptography technology. Surely, surely there's some intersection between these two things, right? Um, are we interested in things like masks, right? There are huge, huge markets. I've gotten so many pings from people who are just like, hey, you know, I'm part of this mask trading pool and we've got, you know, access to, you know, uh, 250 million masks in warehouses all over the world from, you know, hundreds of sellers. And we're matching these people to, you know, like, it sounds exactly like OTC, but now it's OTC mask trading. I've never seen anything like it. I don't know whether that's really fantastically useful to people or whether all the masks are fake. So that's the thing that I'm working on, taking a bunch of my object authentication technology from Materium, figuring out whether we can apply it to all this mask business or for ventilators, respirators, all this kind of equipment. Uh, and I'll show you a demo of that stuff in a second. Well, not the mask stuff, but of the, of the underlying platform. So there's that, right? Keeping money moving, right? What does it look like to implement some kind of basic income system uh, independently of the nation state, right? If you had a system that gave a proven human individual, you know, a uh, hundred coins a day, right? If you breathe, we give you a hundred coins. You prove to us that you're an individual human being and not um, uh, one of a hundred thousand machines, you know, run on a server, right? Um, you prove to us you are actually a flesh and blood person. We give you a hundred tokens a day. Where do they come from? We just print them, right? The more people are involved in that economy, the more tokens we print. Uh, you accept that prices will change because you're constantly putting money into the system, but it's going in at a predictable rate. To balance the system, you might also then want to apply demurrage so that every day the tokens would become less valuable. They literally shrink. You know, your balance is 1,000 tokens on Monday, but by Thursday, it's only 995 uh, to keep the total volume of money in the system uh, equal to the number of people in the system. That is a thing that could be done, right? <clears throat> what are those tokens used for? I don't know. Are people going to continue to want to do work over the internet that they may not have cash dollars to pay for? Yeah, definitely. So the opportunity is for spinning up secondary economies, fantastic. Um, the reason that I think it'd be worth looking at doing a basic income in tokens with Demirage uh, is that those systems are well known for getting economies back from the grave in cold start. So for a lot of people that are working from home because they're you know web designers or you know mm -hmm. authors or whatever it is, they're heading for a cold start, right? They're really, really in a position where their markets have dried up. I have a manuscript for a small book that I was uh, commissioned to write. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I just, I'm not sure whether that thing's ever going to see the light of day. Mm -hmm. You know, the publishers say it's going to be fine. But I'm sort of looking at the world like, you know, somebody's going to try and produce a physical object and distribute it to people in this environment in three months. Ooh, harsh. Um, you know, good luck to them. I'll do what I can to help, but that just looks extremely challenging. So what it means to get a seat at the global table, by fundamental analysis, is that you have to solve a problem mm -hmm. that everybody is impacted by, right, or at least powerful people are impacted by, and that nobody else other than you is able to solve. So your seat at the table is 
if we get rid of those people, a whole bunch of other people will have their lives collapse in a way which is really, really harmful and damaging, and we would be responsible for harming those people if we shut this show down. Right? Um, over and over and over again, you can see this in history, groups will arise, they will take over management of a problem, they get so good at managing that problem, nobody is willing to displace them, because if you displace them, you wind up inheriting the problem. It's one of the fundamental mechanisms by which groups get legitimacy. Even groups which you could argue very strongly have fundamental problems like Hamas, right? Hamas manages to get itself a seat at the table by running a very effective social care system. So is there a seat at the table for Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? Do we solve a global problem that nobody else wants to solve or has the ability to solve? We've taken a crack at it, right? There was a whole period which was all about, we're gonna bank the unbanked, we're gonna do financial services for the bottom pyramid. A lot of talk was talked and a lot of money was raised and a fair number of projects gave that a serious try. I remember for years, I keep running into people at conferences who had, you know, 50 Bitcoin ATMs in Kenya and this kind of stuff. Some of those projects almost certainly wound up being really used. I don't think any of them scaled in the way that things like Mpesa had scaled. But certainly the will was there and there was the beginnings of growth on those fronts. Then the tide shifted in another direction, crypto was for ICOs. And everybody went off in that direction. Not so clear that that was solving a natural problem now, because the underlying problem of getting risk capital into startups was fundamentally there. But we didn't put the risk capital into startups, we put the risk capital into scams. Disastrous. Right? Poisoned the entire field and will be remembered for decades, and that's even if there aren't mass prosecutions. So, and disgorgement. Do not forget the word disgorgement, right? People being legally required to give the money back to their investors is a real thing. So, what are the problems that we could potentially solve, right? Um, let me very quickly show you the Materium demo, just so you've got a sense of what we've been working on. Whoa, not that. No, go away. No, no, no. There we go. Um, now, what do we want to bet that this will actually work in the way we intend? Da, da, da. There we go. So um, we started Materium two and a half years ago. Um, we spent about a year building out a very, very overpowered system from essentially uh, resolving legal disputes globally uh, on the blockchain. Uh, and it was... Uh, five years too early. I'd been around crypto so long that I kind of lost the sense of how long things really take in the real world. So at that point, we pivoted very hard and we took all of that kind of high fluting technology and we narrowed it down to a single class of disputes, which are disputes over the authenticity of physical things. You go to materium.com slash about, you can do this alongside of me and actually have a play with our software. So we've got here a palette of objects. Uh, I'm just gonna click one or two of these open. So opening them in other tabs. Uh, and here is one that I opened earlier. Oh, there we go. So um, you'll need MetaMask installed for this. Here's a little MetaMask window. Just log in here. All right, and we're connecting the app. So um, now you can see we have a bold and handsome captain in party clothes. Looks like he's going to Burning Man. Um, you can see here there's a number. So if we click on that, you can see there's the serial number on the box. And I actually have uh, this physical object in my living room. So uh, now if we click on certificates, what you get is a set of data about the object attached to a contract. So if I click this here contract, it brings me up a huge wadge of legalese. And this stuff is directly drawn from the work that we did on this kind of global uh, court system. So this contract is enforceable in 160 countries uh, and it appoints a private judge um, to oversee disputes associated with the physical object that we're talking about. If the information describing that physical object turns out to be in error, um, you can make a claim if you've signed this contract, if you've paid for cover, 
you can make a claim and ask that that guarantee is used to refund you the damage you've taken from the information that was guaranteed being wrong. And this thing is a literal plain English legal contract. It goes on and on and on and on. And it's packed with all manner of wondrous legal complexity, which is why it's something that can be enforced globally economically. It's not just that it provides you access to global justice, it's access to global justice in a way that's cheap enough you can actually use it in a lot of cases. And now, if we hit sign and pay, uh, it will pop up a transaction into... Oh, where's it gone? What have you done with our MetaMask window? Come on, MetaMask. Uh, okay, so MetaMask seems to have gotten lost somewhere, but in any case, you quick sign and pay, it pops up a little window, MetaMask appears, you send money, you are now the legal counterparty to a contract with the person certifying this information, and Materium is not a party to that contract. So it's literally peer-to-peer -peer authentication of physical goods using the blockchain to record the legal contracts that people have entered into and to give people the payment for those contracts. Um, right now it handles object authentication. Um, before the pandemic kicked in, we were about a month away from being able to do a sale. So first I authenticate what it is that I'm buying, then I buy it. And you could just build up layer by layer by layer with different contracts to cover all these cases. Uh, here's another object. This here is a crypto kaiju. So it's basically a printed crypto kitty. Um, you will notice that it has an RFID tag strategically placed upon its person. Um, and if you scan that thing with a phone, it gives you a unique ID, which allows you to identify what it is you're holding. Um, there's some new technology around which actually puts a key pair on an NFC like that. That's it, NFC, not RFID. Uh, and that key pair allows you to actually sign transactions on the sticker, which is enormously powerful um, in terms of providing authentication for things. So that is an example of a technology. I'm just going to see if I can stop this thing. Uh, there we are. Okay. My back, yeah, I'm back. So that's an example of a technology which is designed for function in the real world. Um, we went after collectibles and wine and fine art basically because that's where there were a bunch of transactions that were reachable. And amusingly, that project makes very little sense to crypto people. Crypto people, like even crypto investors, we try and explain why it is you'd want to be able to prove what a thing is in the physical world. And their eyes just glaze over because most of them own one carry-on bag of stuff and live out of Airbnbs. So the idea of owning physical property seems completely retro to them. But for the people that are physical property people, museum people, wine people, custodians, all this kind of stuff, these technologies make perfect sense. Like they really are very clear. They understand exactly what they're for. Um, and now for us, I'm looking at these crazy markets for masks and for ventilators and for uh, drugs pharmaceuticals um and i'm just looking at that like you know i kind of expected to spend my next year working on toy collections with william shatner and wine and now it looks like we might be gonna get into the business of trying to stop people being killed by buying masks that are substandard that will completely not protect them in the event that they're worn in a hospital setting um, and it's taken me a little bit of time to psychologically prep for that, but I think that's the direction that we're heading in. Um, and obviously we're fundraising again to try and get the wherewithal to actually make that happen. Um, but this is the kind of thing which is seat at the table, right? If we solve the problem of mask, mask authenticity, and if we organize double blind testing of masks by a distributed network of labs where all the test information is logged on chain and then statisticians can crunch over that to figure out whether the masks are good and also whether the labs are good, right? You send them a mix of masks which have been authenticated to work and a set of masks which are up for testing and you put all of that data into a statistical analysis framework. Um, it's definitely possible that that would be a seat at the table not just for us as a company, but for crypto as a whole, because it would be one problem that had gotten solved. Um, there are probably 50 other niches opening up because the existing world systems are under such enormous stress. But we have to think about having such high standards of integrity that people begin to forget all the ICO garbage that was shipped out there and all the money that was made and lost by unfair means, all the force, all the fraud. Um, and we have to basically get into a position where crypto means we're telling you the truth 
And if we're not, you can prove it and you will be able to get compensation, right? Crypto has to mean honest, fair trade. Uh, and that um, that's where I'll stop. Time for questions. Thanks a lot, Vinay. <clears throat> um, so we have one statement and one question that came in. And uh, first of all, I really want to say that it is refreshing or at least very um, motivating to see other people very clearly acknowledging what everybody kind of already knows about crypto, that it isn't as respected and that all these scams that were going on do not help anybody and that there needs to be a change in, in direction. Um, there was one question in the Discord chat uh, about whether you or anybody else here is aware of any projects mm. that come close to anywhere to a no-fraud system. And of course, uh, Matterium is, is going in a, in a good direction, but do you have any answer to that? So I think some of the work... Um, so I think, uh, do you know this project, the Legal DAO? Um, so Legal DAO is doing quite an interesting thing, right? They're only, they're, they're probably going to be much more interesting in a year. But what they're starting with is the idea that you take the legal framework of a company, which is given to you by a government, and then you 100% pack it with clever crypto stuff so that you can see where the share registers are and the board resolutions and all the rest of this kind of machinery completely transparent inside of that setting. So I think that's kind of amazing um, because, I mean, shareholders are notoriously not active, right? U.S. companies, large publicly traded companies, in theory, the shareholders are the directors of the company. In practice, the shareholders are strongly discouraged from voting and most of them don't bother to. So the idea that you could actually begin to straighten out some of the corporate nonsense by having publicly traded companies that were actively controlled and managed by their shareholders. So if they started doing abusive stuff, the shareholders would vote to stop them. Uh, you know, I think DAO is a, a small step on a path which could lead to that kind of reformation of corporate governance. Um, so I'm very excited by that. Uh, there are 50 million track and trade project, track and trace projects, right? Uh, for food, for vegetables, you know, swordfish, tuna, uh, electronics, lots and lots of people doing authenticity work over there. All of that counts. They're all pushing fraud out of the supply chain. Um, so yeah, I think I think there are lots of disconnected pieces around of that picture. What we're lacking is an ideological stand, right? You know, non-aggression principle makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. As I say, I think it's not wrong, but it's also not sufficient. Um, and you know, the idea that we could actively make enforcement of no fraud a critical part of what we're doing in a way which really means no fraud, like fraud was not committed, nobody would look at this and call it fraud, legally speaking, it's not fraud. The idea that we could take that as being an ideological platform where you would look at a quid pro project and say that fails the non-aggression principle and we're not going to let that thing present, there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, because we've got the ideological machinery, we just haven't applied it at home. We're all about telling other people no force, no fraud. Well, what about us? Can I uh, can I uh, interject something here really quick? Please, please. Um, hey, Vinay, man, thanks for coming. So cool. What a great what what a what a great piece of information. If you'd like to continue this conversation with anybody for the uh, right after the chat, all you got to do is click in on create your own room, and you'll get a pop up, and you can name it ah. and. That link will then be persistent for the length of the chat, uh, the the conference. It's a persistent Gypsy room, mm -hmm. and you can tweet that out on Twitter or or post it in, in in any channels, and you can continue this conversation with anybody that you're interested in. Excellent. Just letting you know about that feature. Cool. Yeah, this is a quite a comprehensive piece of software. This is a nice tool. Thank you. We're, we've built it for this, and now it's uh, an an open source project uh, available wow. on GitHub. Oh, and it's got a Bitcoin cool. grant, and it's we're working together with the Ethereum Foundation and ETH Global. And we're going to be doing multiple conferences with this um, uh, after this. So um, it's amazing to see it all work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, now, now that I know that you guys actually wrote it for this thing, I'm even more amazed to see it works. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 video stuff is hard. Yeah, Kai Garrett has been true. doing it for a long time, and uh, he built this in React. And uh, we've done all the integrations and everything, and it's going to iterate forward. It's only got the, the Web 2.0 features now, but of course, we can use Unlock Protocol or Kickback or any of the things to, to limit entry. And 
we've solved the uh, troll problem uh, with Jitsi that all all users were moderators. Now we have a token system for the moderators. So Jake can have a token, I have a token, and we've nice. got control over it. So sorry for interrupting on that. No, um, super cool. Nice work, guys. Nice work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I gotta go back over to the crypto economics lab, man. Okay, cool. Have fun. <clears throat> Thanks, Michael. Um, to go a bit back on that, um, before you presented a bit on, on the global uh, legal framework that you're trying to uh, get into reality now. Um, what I was wondering is with possession of objects and information about objects, it can be quite clear in a lot of jurisdictions on um, on what the rules for that are. So that might make it easier to have it a bit more standardized. But once you're moving out of possession of objects, that becomes a lot unclearer. Is there Are there any steps of going into that direction or is the focus right now really on on getting that as perfect as possible. Okay, so there's there's new law and there's old law. Um, old law is typically things like real estate, and real estate is just every country has its own weird ways of doing things, and those weird ways cannot be changed because you know there's trillions of dollars locked into the existing frameworks. Um, and new law, patent, copyright. Um, other kinds of intellectual property, most corporate law involving you know stocks and shares, bonds, this kind of stuff. Most of that law is pretty standard internationally. Um, so there's no reason that you can't take a fairly broad approach on those issues. Like if I sell you a copyright license and it does a common thing, most countries in the world will work pretty much the same way for that license. You might have to do some localization for it, but generally speaking, not so difficult. Um, the other approach is that you can domicile intellectual property in places like, say, Bermuda, where you just have a corporation in Bermuda where I take my work and I sell a license to the corporation in Bermuda. The corporation in Bermuda then resells that license to everybody that wants that license, but all of the legal structures are in Bermuda, and then I get a revenue stream for that. And that's one of the ways that you can regularize uh, the law that applies to a situation. Um, but, I mean, the bottom line is that what will inevitably emerge from this kind of process over the next 10 to 20 years is something that looks like satellite mapping, but for legal systems. So you'll wind up with one or more companies or a project like OpenStreetMap, uh, and there's a project called CleanApp, I want to say, um, which is taking a crack at the kind of OpenStreetMap approach. But their idea, and, you know, the core idea, is that you just wind up with a hugely complex database of all of the different legal structures in the world re represented in a way which is machine readable so you know in a given jurisdiction whether a given legal operation is legal right and it's just like you know it's like root mapping if you want to do this right in this jurisdiction it's a straight line in this jurisdiction you have to make a stop in the middle and do the following operation before you can do the next part and you can see how big a job that would be right i mean that's a, a gigantic effort, but if you look at the amount of time that went into Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap, it's not a bizarrely inconceivable effort. And if we had that map of global law and global regulation worked out, you'd start with the areas which are highest value and easiest, and then gradually you'd creep out and get more and more and more coverage. But what that gives us is the ability to start automating compliance. I tell a machine what it is that I want to accomplish. The machine goes and figures out the legal pathway through the system. If the machine can't find a legal pathway through the system, it raises a flag and says, go get a human to help me. And then we wheel in a lawyer and the lawyer figures out how to do it. And then that knowledge is transferred to the machine. So next time we don't have to call the lawyer. Not that I'm suggesting we automate the lawyers out of existence or anything, but just in principle. I like lawyers. <laughs> We don't want to have the lawyers as enemies either. <laughs> I will say that a lot of lawyers are very afraid of technology specifically because they think it's going to take their jobs. But my, you know, history seems to suggest that every time a profession uh, is exposed to tools which theoretically replace the profession, all that happens is the professionals climb on top of those tools and the field becomes vastly more productive and people get much better value for money when they spend in the field. Classic example of that is graphic design where everybody thought that everybody was going to be their own graphic designer because of desktop publishing in the 1980s and 1990s. And all that happened is the great graphic designers were so much more empowered by the tools that the global standard of design went through the roof. 
Um, so I think the same would actually happen with lawyers. Like if we did large scale legal automation, all that would happen is the lawyers would do amazing new creative work and you'd get much more sophisticated use of law. It's not that you would wind up with, you know, a whole bunch of lawyers begging in the streets with tin caps. Right? Which is by the way how the French Revolution started. Nobody's doing that again. Um, but I think that what you would get is just uh, a vastly more sophisticated use of automated legal contract creation tools. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you here. Um, and I think that even if these are unfortunate times, this huge push to uh, home office, to using digital infrastructure might also help those rather traditional uh, working places where digital infrastructure was not yet integrated into the regular workflow. Yeah. And where we might see a shift to more automation, to more usage of, for example, lawyers using uh, automated uh, workflows for their day-to-day -day business. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. We got one question in the chat, which is, "What is my concern with DAOs?" Um, so the the problem with DAOs in general um, is threefold. So the first is they don't provide much legal protection. So there's a pretty good chance that if you are in a position where you've got voting rights in a DAO and somebody else loses money because of a decision that you either did vote on or maybe could have theoretically voted on, you might be in a position where they can sue you, right? So it may be that participation in DAOs is only safe if you're 100% anonymous. And even then, you know, liability transfer, what it is, you know, I think there are a bunch of sticky unresolved legal problems around DAOs, problem one. Uh, problem two, how do we decide when the DAOs purposes or technology have to be changed? What happens if somebody, you know, if circumstances change in such a way that the thing that a DAO was created to do no longer is worth doing, how do we alter direction? Who's responsible for making the call? And what do you do with minorities that are 100% against the decision which is made? Okay, maybe they can sell out and buy something else, but we, we just have to be careful that we're not creating a system where you've got tyranny of the majority in a position where nobody has any legal rights. Because the, the, in law, the rights of minorities are protected specifically. So if you've got 51% of a company, that doesn't mean that you can then just print stock, give it to yourself, and then completely screw the guys that had 49%. They have a set of structural protections in place. And it's not clear that that kind of thinking has come to DAOs in any kind of sophisticated way yet. Um, and then the third thing is, I mean, really fundamental, which is, why are we replicating corporations more or less unit for unit on the blockchain? Like if we wanted a better world, why are we taking a system that seems to be super broken and super extractive and re-implementing it, right? We made that mistake with money. We re-implemented money exactly like money and money turns out to be super destructive in the ways that we've currently done it, right? All of the pathologies of the real economy, you know, a, an environment dominated by enormously rich people with very variable temperament who are completely unaccountable to everybody else and are hugely manipulating the game for their own advantage. Wasn't that the system that we were trying to fix? Right? So, you know, same thing with corporations. Why have we gone and re-implemented the corporations? Right? I, I just feel like maybe building a scale model of a broken system and calling it a new system may not actually be progress. Right? And this is not to say that I have an immediate clear idea about what we should be building instead, but I would like to see diverse experiments in these areas rather than a slavish re-implementation of the broken systems of the real world. You know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Thanks for that answer, Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. 